Thank you, thank you, Giora, or Yuri, as we would say in Hungary. Um, the, um, yes, it's a, it's a real privilege to be here with you, and it's so good to see so many familiar faces in this, uh, in this great crowd. As, uh, as you can see, I will speak about one particular um, form of cooperation or collaboration uh, with various stakeholders and the patient community. Uh, for a, a little more about my background, I indeed I come from Hungary, I live in uh, Germany now. Uh, this is actually the first time that I sit behind the German flag <laughs> as, a, as a representative of Germany. Um, and um, I am a social psychologist, I've been living with HIV for 15 years. Uh, I'm also a former hepatitis C patient, I'm cured. Um, I, I have, um, I'm diagnosed with various mental conditions. I'm a former substance user, and I'm, I'm set to defend my PhD about uh, patient organizations later this year. And I'm, I'm a trained psychologist, so as I usually say, how much worse can it get? Um, the, um, this, um, what, what, I'm, what I'm going to talk about today, which is the community advisory boards, uh, model uh, is something that originates from the HIV tradition and something that we've been doing in, in the HIV AIDS advocacy world for um, more than 20 years, actually almost 25 years now. Um, and uh, we found over the years that this is a model that, um, that provides a very good framework for all stakeholders to, um, to cooperate and to further research and development in, in, a, in a meaningful way, and also to establish a neutral environment for patient communities and for patient experts to get involved um, in, uh, in research and development and, uh, and in, in biomedical research in general. I will also talk a little more about um, so I will rush through my slides and then I will also talk a little more about um, funding because I heard you that this is something that comes up again and again. Uh, I heard a question in the previous session about um, uh, bias and impartiality, so how you can uh, maintain or preserve um, your status as an independent patient organization despite uh, receiving and accepting funds from um, from pharmaceutical companies or other companies, so from, from industry. This is something where a lot of theoretical work is going on as well in the background by um, patient organizations and also by ethic ethicists. Um, and, um, and I will try to leave some time for questions. Those of you who know me know that I'm, like we say in Hungary, you will have to kill my tongue separately when I die because I'm really a talker. It's, um, these are my disclosures, not so much to disclose. Um, uh, and I owe thanks to these people who, who have been helping my work over the years. Um, first of all, I would like to leave this here with you, um, this, this diagram of patient involvement, which was developed by a bunch of colleagues of mine, uh, Jan Geisler, Bettina Rill, who I'm, I'm, I'm sure you also know, um, um, Susanna Leto and Mary Ullenhop. Um, this was also published uh, recently in, uh, in a scientific journal. Um, this diagram describes the various stages of, of uh, pharmaceutical development or medicine development, and also um, how you, I mean, how patients, how patient experts can get involved uh, in these various stages of, um, of research and development. And we believe that there's a legitimate place for patient representatives along this whole spectrum of, um, of research and development. And that's exactly where we try to make sure that patients, patient representatives or expert patients, as we call them, um, are well prepared, are well equipped to actually participate um, uh, in, uh, in this process. I'm sure that the slides will be distributed to you uh, later, so you will have ample time to, uh, to read this, but you also find this with explanations um, on, the, on the UPATI uh, website, which is the European Patients Academy for Therapeutic Innovation. So um, there's one, one uh, so, so the, the work that I'm going to talk about actually concerns um, uh, this whole spectrum that you can see here. It creates community advisory boards, actually create a framework, create a platform 
um, uh, for patients and other stakeholders uh, to be involved across the whole spectrum um, uh, in, in, a, in a rigorously scientific manner. So what, I'm, what, what we try to focus on with community advisory boards is primarily the science uh, of your particular illness or of your particular condition, um, which also involves policy work because these two things go hand in hand. Uh, and are inseparable, but we also find that uh, you will not be able to enforce or to uh, implement your policy objectives without being scientifically prepare, prepared for the work that you need to do. So you have to understand what you talk about before you can actually achieve uh, results. So what are community advisory boards in the first place? Um, these are patient organizations, um, uh, so to say, which uh, work in a, in, in a strictly, and I will emphasize this again and again, which work in a strictly scientific um, uh, framework. Um, and they are also community-led. They are established and run by the community. So these, these advisory boards are preferably not set up by ministries or by doctors or by companies, but they are set up and controlled and run by the community of patients. That's a very, that's a very important, that's a key tenet. Uh, to the work we do. They create a two-way dialogue. So it's not only um, uh, that uh, the community complains to companies or other stakeholders or vice versa, that companies come or other stakeholders, regulators, scientists come and they give instructions uh, to, to, to the patient community, but it really creates a two-way communication platform where people, all stakeholders are on equal footing. Um, it's, it also brings together the patient community from all across um, uh, the, the area, be that the geographical area, uh, which in case of a, uh, of a rare disease might be global, like in your case, in case of HIV, which is uh, also global, but it's not so uncommon anymore, unfortunately. Um, there we have regional cabs or we have country cabs. So depending on the size of your community, you will, um, uh, you will be able to organize cabs on, 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 if you like, on a lower level, doesn't necessarily have to be uh, uh, global. Um, and we try to focus on, um, on um, various issues such as diagnosis, monitoring, treatment and care, and research and um, uh, development. Um, one objective, and this was the original um, purpose while, uh, why the HIV and AIDS uh, Community Advisory Board was first set up, uh, what we want to make sure is that um, uh, these, uh, th th that clinical trials which are being organized in the given um, uh, disease area are actually representing the patient's needs and the patient community itself. So our focus is making sure that instead of the ideal patient, which you will probably know what, what is the ideal patient like. The ideal patient is white, middle-aged man. Uh, has a job, has food, has sex twice a week, takes his medicine every time when he is supposed to take his medicine, uh, goes to work, lives in a stable environment and produces nice results. That's what the ideal patient is like. How many of you live a life like that? You don't have to raise your hands, I know. How many of you live a life like that? So it is. So we want to make sure that actual real patients are represented in uh, in clinical trials. And as you will hear later today, there will be a session about clinical trials. Clinical trials are an essential vehicle still for access as well. So that's also why it's so important for us to make sure that real patients have access to clinical trials and that clinical trials are designed according to the needs of real patients. Um, and then we can talk a lot more about why women are so underrepresented in science, both on both sides, the research, but also in terms of participation in clinical trials. So you will see um, that actually we create um, uh, a, a, a space here in, in, the, in the middle where these four stakeholders can come together in a neutral environment and can work together and, um, and, and, and make meaningful contribution uh, to science. This is actually not really new. This was first described by a bunch of sociologists uh, 15 years ago um, when they were only talking about a triple helix of, um, 
of uh, knowledge production, which involved academia, regulators, and the industry. And then actually through the work of the HIV community, um, especially some of my colleagues um, and myself, we, we successfully added this fourth dimension, which is civil society. And civil society is you, the expert patients. Uh, who contribute to this uh, to this work? Now, the, uh, the the European Community Advisory Board in HIV and AIDS um, was established in 1997. Um, and it was originally something that was devised and something that was um, uh, set up as, uh, surprisingly, as a joint effort of uh, pharmaceutical companies at the time. It was born out of need because pharmaceutical companies um, messed up their own uh, uh, community advisory boards so badly that they had no choice than to find an alternative solution. You can read about the history of all of this on the European AIDS Treatment Group's website and in my papers. <laughs> the, um, but actually, that's, that was how it was set up. So when anyone says that it's impossible to set up community advisory boards with the involvement of several companies, then you can confidently say that's not true because it's been there for more than 20 years in the HIV AIDS field. Um, it is the, the ECAB or the European Community Advisory Board is actually a working group of a larger organization, which is the European AIDS Treatment Group. That's my, that's my original home organization. That's a network of individuals living with HIV in Europe. Uh, Europe is WHO Europe, so it's this wider region of 53 countries. Um, and um, it's, it's a pretty big organization by now, started um, almost 30 years ago. Um, and actually, right now, we have um, 112 members um, uh, representing more or less 38 countries. So there's a coming and going. Uh, there's a lot of succession planning in this. There's a lot of training behind the work that we do in order to make sure that, um, that this membership is actually well-trained, um, is, is well-equipped to deal um, with, the, with the scientific issues and with the challenges and also with the policy matters. Um, that, uh, that are uh, involved. And, but you might say, okay, well, that sounds nice, but what is it that you've been able to achieve um, with, with community advisory board? And here's a, here's a list of, um, of various achievements that we've had over the last two um, uh, decades, which goes from, from micromanaging things, such as um, influencing uh, uh, trial protocols or study protocols, um, we receive study protocols before they are implemented. So rather than just rubber stamping them uh, formally or ticking the box that a patient saw the protocol, we actually get the protocol in the development phase, which means that we can make a real meaningful in, 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 uh, influence or impact on that. Uh, never be satisfied with anything less. That's what I recommend because it's easier to influence protocols up front than when it's already being implemented and you want to change, you want the protocol change. That's always more complicated. So insist on receiving um, uh, uh, protocols um, up to the highest policy uh, uh, levels, including stopping trials um, uh, through our members sitting in the SMBs um, and including uh, having a strong influence on European decision-making bodies. So once again, if anyone tells you that the patient community is just not well equipped to influence health policy on a European or on a, on a national level, it's simply not true. We've been doing this in HIV and we've been doing this in hepatitis, uh, in, in viral hepatitis, but also in tuberculosis for many years. So there are good practices in the background that you can rely on um, if you want to make that step um, and, and um, elevate your work onto the, onto the, to the highest policy level. Uh, you can just look at this when you get the slides, what, what these achievements are. They are also well described in papers, uh, websites, um, all those resources are openly available in the, in the internet. As I said, actually the, the European um, AIDS Treatment Group is a, is, is a wider structure. So the Community Advisory Board um, is, uh, is only a part of, um, of the EATG. The EATG, because it developed organically and because it's a patient organization, it's a, it's a civil society organization, it's a, it's a fragile and complex entity, yet it works. So don't, um, 
don't be scared if your organization, if your, if your patient organization develops weirdly. Also, don't fall into the trap of trying to establish corporate structures for your patient organizations, because that might not always be possible. I've heard so many lectures about how to establish properly working boards, um, supervisory boards, uh, boards of trustees, and what not for patient organizations, while probably many of your own patient organizations are just mom and pop shops. And you do this in your living room. And you get together once a week over tea. And we are so far from establishing boards. Now, we really took this road of organic development in the, in the EATG, which is both good and bad. Um, it's good because it remained close to the community, actual people living with HIV, viral hepatitis, and tuberculosis. But it's also bad because we have to professionalize our work and we have to find this balance. So I leave, we have not found a real solution to this, so I leave it to you. You teach me then how far you got. Now, let's come to the money part, which I know is extremely important um, uh, for all of you. Actually, because it's a community advisory board, this means that we provide a service to the industries that come to us to speak which also means that they pay for it. So you pay for participation. I mean, if you're a company, uh, be that a pharmaceutical company or a diagnostics company or, or, or a, a, a biomedical de development company, you pay to come to, to an ECAB meeting. There's a set fee for a half day that you have to pay. And um, for this, in exchange for this, you get services from us. You get access to a huge pool of knowledge which exists in the patient community. And actually, this is what we provide as a service. So when we do protocol review, that's not just for fun, that's work, that's a service that we provide to the companies. So you will see that this is a, this is a different attitude to just being second in line or third or tenth in line when it comes to protocol development. This means that you're actually professional advisors and professional advisors should be paid. So um, this helps actually then to fund our other work, which is training and development, succession planning, um, conference participation, um, I know that in many disease areas this is still uncommon, but in HIV, fortunately, we've come to the level or to the point, and also in viral hepatitis, where patient representatives naturally participate in conferences and they speak and they chair sessions, very much like here, uh, but in major um, uh, international uh, medical conferences. That should be the objective. It's not, it's, and you know how it's doable. It is doable because it is about science. So we always get this question, yes, but do you remain an independent uh, patient organization or an independent body if you accept money from, from industry? Does industry then influence you? Do you immediately become a slave to, the, to industry money just because you accept this? Now, from an emancipatory view, I'm sorry, so from or an, or an, an, an empowerment point of view, this is a very weird question because this actually suggests that just by receiving money from someone, you lose your mind. But that doesn't happen. So you still remain a sound-minded individual or a group of people just because you receive money. It's not where you get that money from in this case, it's how you spend that money. That's what matters. And whether you are transparent about spending that money. And because we are able, we have been able to prove that, uh, that community advisory boards are about science. So we focus on working in science and we focus on understanding um, and furthering the science of, um, of uh, our given disease uh, or therapeutic areas. That's why this interaction has never been seen as a commercial one, but it's seen as a scientific interaction. And that's what matters because this is why the European Union and the European Commission has also accepted, my time's up, 
Jesus. This is also because um, the, the, uh, the, the European Commission has also accepted the European Community Advisory Board and the, the European AIDS Treatment Group as an independent body. So we are not excluded from interacting with the MA. We are not excluded from interacting with other European com uh, uh, Commission bodies. Uh, just because we work with industry, because our work is scientifically based. So that's actually, um, that's, what, that's what matters. So meeting agendas are always set by the community. We say what we want to talk about. We certainly accept proposals from the industry, but the agenda is set and controlled by the community, and we do not accept marketing presentations, because that also jeopardizes our own status. Uh, if, we, if we allow that to happen. We don't accept marketing people to come to the meetings, but it must be scientists, it must be um, uh, research leads, it must be protocol um, uh, designing people, uh, it must be chief investigators who come to the meetings rather than the marketing department uh, or the compliance department. Although compliance people are very welcome to come. They have a bit to learn there. Um, so typically these are two and a half day meetings. Um, the, um, you see how it's, uh, how it's set up. Companies can uh, book half days um, and we always, always reserve time for training so that we, uh, we, talk, we can talk within the community without the participation of any external partners. We can talk about um, uh, issues that matter. Uh, uh, in, in the development of, um, uh, of uh, medicine or in uh, the social science, for example, because HIV is just as much a social illness as it is biological. Um, so we, we, try, we try to make sure that training is continuously um, uh, there and you c there's no cherry picking. So once when you come, you must stay the whole meeting. It's not like, okay, so this, I mean, Saturday morning is interesting, but I will just skip Saturday afternoon and go back home. That's, that's a no go. You cannot do that. Uh, we have a set of rules that we use and that's also being implemented in other disease areas, notably also in the CML advocates network for their own cab meetings. Um, and you will see that it's, it's spreading. <laughs> so the model of, um, of community advisory boards is spreading. So we already have uh, CML CAB. Uh, I know that several of you also participate or have been um, uh, um, there. And then it doesn't stop there still because there's further development going on. For example, with the first HEMCAB uh, meeting that was organized um, two months ago, two? two months ago, um, where um, according to the same model, according to the same rules, but in a completely different disease area, which is um, hematological malignancies, um, uh, the community could su su successfully implement the same model and something very similar is now also happening in melanoma and in uh, respiratory diseases, so in, in uh, lung cancers and um, asthma. Now, these are the main lessons that we've learned. It's work. I think that the, the final line that build a secretariat, so you must take it seriously. It's not something that you can do just, you know, uh, next to something else. So you have to focus on building a secretariat and, and uh, making sure that it works more or less uh, professionally. Um, that's it. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot be short.